This is the BBC. This podcast is supported by advertising outside the UK. Thanks for downloading the In Our Time podcast. For more details about In Our Time and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. I hope you enjoy the programme. Hello. Had the famous and fabled Library at Alexandria founded at the beginning of the 3rd century BC not existed, it might have been invented by one of the many stories housed within its walls. It's a building of legendary status, a library set up to contain all the knowledge of all the world on shelf upon shelf of Egyptian papyri. The legacy of the library is still with us, not just in the ideas it stored and the ideas it seeded, but also in the way it organised knowledge and the tools developed for dealing with that knowledge. To this day, it influences the things we know and the way we know them. With me to discuss the library at Alexandra, a Serafina Cuomo, reader in Roman history at Birkbeck College, London, Matthew Nichols, lecturer in classics at the University of Reading, and Simon Goldhill, professor of Greek at Cambridge University. Simon Goldhill, perhaps the best place to start this programme is not in Alexandria itself, but with the death of its founder, Alexander the Great, who died in 323 BC. What kind of world did he leave behind him? The world as yet unconquered, but then can you tell us why he made for Alexandra? Alexander changed the world for all time by spreading Greek culture across all of the East. He conquered the barbarian empire, as the Greeks called it, of Persia. He got as far as Afghanistan and India, and across through Egypt as well. And what he spread throughout that world was Greek culture. It meant Greek language and Greek institutions. He founded cities across all of that area. And what that meant was that for the next 800 years, the language of the elite was Greek, and the language, indeed, of a lot of the people became Greek. It's extraordinary to think that the language of a place like Jerusalem for 800 years was Greek. The Gospels, written in Greek. All of this because of the spread of his world. Now, when he died, three generals took control over the massive empire, and the one we're most concerned with was Ptolemy, who took control of Egypt. And so we're left with a new Greek ruling elite over this area of Egypt. His body was taken to Alexandria by mm-hmm. General Ptolemy, the, mm-hmm. uh, his favourite general, yeah. who became Ptolemy the I of Sotar, wasn't he? Um, yeah. uh, anyway, um, mm. why did he want to go to Alexandria? Was it more or less a, an empty plain? Alexandria was founded by Alexander. It was mm. his favourite Alexandria. He founded several of them, but it was the biggest. And it rapidly became the biggest city in the world. And within 50 years, it had become this massive metropolis. And partly because of the influence of Alexander's body being there and partly because of its unique position in terms of trade and in terms of possibility. And it brought in this extraordinary polyglot community. So we have a lot of Egyptians going in there. They're being ruled by this small Greek elite, Macedonian elite, which was uh, in charge of the city and spoke Greek. You have other nationalities flooding in. And you have this extraordinary explosion of poly, polyglot, lots of languages, lots of cultures, lots of mix. What other? It's, it's nice to know we've got. We, we, it's in Egypt. We've got the Egyptians. We've got the Greeks. Who else? Well, you all have had. You have Jews in there. There was a very famous Jewish community in there, speaking Aramaic in all probability. You would have had Syrians coming in from the north. You would have had people from coming up from Africa, from from further south in Africa. So you would have seen different skin colours, different races, and above it all, this small elite of Greeks, led by the Ptolemies, focused on the palace and on Greek culture. And what's so hard for the Greeks at this point, living in this place, is they're deracinated, they're separated from the central mainland, where all the national cults are and where the the homeland. And so they have to invent a culture. A little bit like the British in India. You have to invent your own Britishness, your own Greekness here in Alexandria. You have to invent cults. You have, to pr- you have to do something to make your culture survive in this world. And the library was part of that. So we're talking about a city built from scratch here, are we? Yes. Extraordinary thought. That he came, he founded it, he marked it out. It's rather sweet. It had five quarters that were labelled Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, Epsilon, A, B, C, D, E, right? which we s- were said to be for Alexander the King, descendant of God, founded this city. Now, that's a nice story to tell about how it's put together, but these quarters were laid out, it had a proper structure, and it was part of the way in which Greeks did invent a world. Right, going back to Plato, going back all the way into the sophistic movement of the 5th century, this idea that you could create a new world for yourself. 
and that's very much part of that that that, that Greek colonizing spirit. Matthew Nichols, can you take us into the library itself? Could you place the library in the city? Um, we told you grew to be the largest city by Simon uh, in 50 years. It was built on a very grand scale. Perhaps you could elaborate a little and uh, that a little, and then tell us about the library. Certainly, the city, um, rapidly growing in the period at which the library was founded, contains in its northeast corner a palace district called the Brocaeon district. Sadly, that's now beneath the sea. It's subsided into the sea, and we don't know very much about it archaeologically, though increasingly we're, we're finding out details. Uh, so the library was located within that palace district, associated with, in some senses, inside the royal palace. It's something that the kings keep absolutely close to themselves and their court. We don't have the library buildings, but by analogy with other libraries and by some educated guesswork about the organisation of the library, we might think that the library book rooms, which must be substantial because we're talking about up to half a million books, if we believe the ancient sources, um, stored in a series of rooms. Those rooms may be divided somehow by subject, maybe with some alphabetisation uh, within the holdings, so that's conjecture. Um, and the library associated with, perhaps connected to physically, uh, the museum, which we do know a little bit more about because ancient authors described that to us directly. A museum, can you? Yeah. Certainly, a museum... No, in, no, just in let's stay with the library. Can't yes. do a museum in a minute. So we're Certainly. in this library. Go, can you give us some sense of the size of it and, the, and what's going on there? We didn't rush. What, what's it like? Mm -hmm. And how did... Sorry, to include in this question, comparing you with other libraries that we know about, the library at Ur and the contemporary library at Antioch and Pergamum and yes. so on. Just give us some... Con if you could give us some context. Please. The best preserved library, um, not quite contemporary to it, but um, uh, about a century later is the library at Pergamum, which we have found archaeologically. I think we have. And that consists of a series of four rooms off the colonnade of the sanctuary of Athena. So these are rooms... Uh, medium to large rooms, we're not talking about vast uh, marble halls, but uh, pretty substantial rooms. In Pergamum, um, around the room runs a U-shaped podium about a metre high. Um, on that podium, we think, um, stood uh, wooden bookcases. There are attachment points in the top of this podium wall um, that are conjectured to be for wooden bookcases with the books stored in them and separated from the wall slightly to prevent the permeation of damp into the books. What about earlier libraries like Ur and Babylon? Those libraries contain clay tablets, not papyrus scrolls, or clay mm. tablets which survive and wooden writings which don't. Um, and the fine context of those are pretty poorly understood because they were dug in the 19th century and the clay tablets are now not very far away in the British Museum. So those were tablets stored again on wooden shelving, which doesn't survive, but the clay tablets do. So how, then, is Alexandria distinguished, both from that which followed it, Pergamum, and those which preceded it? Um, by scale, uh, by scope and ambition. And we think, by the way, it started systematically to organise its books, to classify them, list them, uh, probably house them in a way that uh, reflected a sort of scholarly order. That's uh, the unique contribution of Alexandria. To be literal-minded, um, what about the scale? You've talked, uh, you've given us some idea of permanent. Can you give us some idea of... Uh, I know there isn't much left, but uh, you, know, you can dig away. The... Um, the ancient literary sources which we rely on for um, any testimony of what books were there or how many books are, for various reasons, not wholly reliable, but they centre in on a figure of roughly half a million papyrus scrolls. One papyrus scroll would hold about 2,000 lines of writing, so uh, a book or a couple of books of Homer, one attic tragedy, something like that, which gives you the idea of the scale of the library's holdings. A papyrus scroll is And is this much bigger than anything that has happened? Hugely before? bigger, yes. And the authors agree um, that it was massively ambitious and that it held a large number of books, even if we don't take the numbers literally, and we probably shouldn't. The fact that they're unanimous in talking about enormous um, scale of holdings is suggestive of the, uh, the ambition of the library and its librarians. And now on to this museum, which mm. became our museum. What's significant about that? That is one of the things that transforms this library from being merely a sort of royal curio cabinet stuffed full of books into being a working resource, an actual scholarly institution. The museon, Greek word, just means a place where the muses are active. Um, philosophical schools have museons, it's where we get our English word museum. So it's in some sense a temple of the muses, that is, of the arts. And the museon is a place, um, it's an institution and it's a community. So... It's attached again to the palace. Uh, we know a little bit more about its physical layout because we have the testimony of a Greek geographer called Strabo who says that it contains an exedra, which is a room like a lecture hall with seats for lectures and debates, we presume. It contains an oikos, or hall, where the scholar community takes its meals in a common table. And it contains a covered walkway, or peripatos, uh, which derives from... Um, the, the covered walkways of Greek philosophical schools and which lends its name, for example, to the peripatetic branch of philosophy. It simply means somewhere where you walk up and down. 
so the scholars would walk under the shade with their books from the book rooms, uh, debating and, and reading and talking. Seraphina Cuomo, we have this heavily subsidised, as the contemporary word would use, library by Ptolemy. They obviously they wanted this to be a striking place. They wanted it to be of great significance. They wanted the world to take notice. Why were they so determined to do that? For more than one reason. One of the uh, reasons that may have been behind Ptolemy's decision to invest so much in the library and the museum relates to what Simon was saying earlier. Trying to forge a Greek identity in a new territory, in a, a land that has centuries, millennia of history, as an Egyptian history, and try to impose a new government which is very different, which has a different language, different institutions, different religions. So it's taking on the Egyptian, as it were, for one, in one respect. It's saying Egypt, Egypt stops here, Greek starts now. I think that may have been it initially. Uh, I think as the library and the museum carry on their intellectual and cultural life, uh, we go more and more in the direction of maybe integrating the two or doing something that becomes Greek-Egyptian. So later on you see a translation of Egyptian works into Greeks, as if the Greeks were interested in actually knowing about Egyptian history and relying on their tradition. Um, another reason, as well as uh, uh, forging and uh, um, imposing of Greek identity, has to do, I think, with political competition. The Ptolemy was not the only successor of Alexander. Again, as Simon said, there were three of them. The Hellenistic kingdoms, as they're called, were continuously at war with each other. War can take place in more than one battlefield. One is the real battlefield, the military one, the battle with catapults and soldiers and all that. But another battlefield is cultural competition. So there are stories about how the library at Alexandria competed with the library at Pergamon, for instance. There's even a story in Vitruvius, which is probably false, that says that the library at Alexandria started because there was already a library at Pergamon and Ptolemy, the king of Egypt, was jealous of that. Ale uh, Alexander was famously a pupil of Aristotle. Is the, the, uh, the, more than the ghost of the hand of Aristotle evident in this library? More people would say yes. Uh, one of the most famous stories about the foundation of the library is that a, a pupil of Aristotle called Demetrius of Phaleron was involved as a consultant of sorts. Demetrius had had a very active political life in Athens. Then times changed and he was basically, he fell in disgrace. So he had to move and he seems to have moved to Alexandria where he was uh, um, instrumental in uh, helping with founding the library, telling the king what to invest in, organizing it to begin with. It is a story but it seems to have some basis in reality. So what would that effect be seen in the categorization, the classification that Aristotle was uh, one of the things he was famous for? Aristotle seems to have had uh, a very ambitious project. He was interested in all branches of knowledge. Together with his students, um, he produced the treatises on practically every form of knowledge, from logic to biology, from physics to metaphysics, which includes what we could call theology. And he seems to have been rather systematic about it. So he was interested in classification, he was interested in definition, he was interested in how the system of knowledge is put together. Now, if Demetrius shared that view, that may have been carried into how the various parts of the library were organized. Can I ask you, Simon Golden, the, the, business, the library himself became very important, the chief librarian. Can mm -hmm. we pick out one, Aristosthenes of Cyrene, uh, famous geographer and so on. Mm -hmm. And what, what function did the chief librarian have? He, he seems to appear in history at this point, but appear in a very important way. Um, it, did he decide, he alone decide what was in the library. Can you just give us some, using Aristotle, er, yeah, yeah, and we'll start again, using Eratosthenes. Eratosthenes, yes, 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 uh, the geographer. Yeah, uh, 
the librarian is a, is, is a rather shadowy figure at one level because we don't know what he did institutionally at any one point. Mm. He must have had some say in the collection policies, but the king was also directly involved and there must have been a lot of other people too. Most importantly, he was a sort of superior academic who would uh, write technical treatises of various sorts to do with books, to do with ordering knowledge, but could also be a poet. We're told that Callimachus, one of the most famous poets of the ancient world, who had a huge influence on Latin poetry as well as on Greek, was actually the librarian at Alexandria and there, and uh, was writing from within the library. Well, Eratosthenes himself was remarkable as a geographer, wasn't he? His measurement of the, uh, of the measurement of the past stayed for yeah. centuries and centuries. Absolutely. I mean, he was, and he was also a supreme rationalist who talked about the impossibility of following uh, Homer's version of the world in various ways and uh, famously said, if you, uh, if you can show me the, the the cobbler who sowed the sack of the winds, I'll show you where it is you travel. <laughs> so, um, um, yeah. But what was in... So we've got the library. Alexander inspired, mm -hmm. Ptolemy built it, biggest city in the world in 50 years, mm -hmm. placing itself as a cultural force against Egypt in the, in, in the past, against the other Hellenistic kingdoms. The mainland is over there. They want to vie with that as well. What's in it? Can you give us some idea of what they collected? all knowledge. It's a fantastically ambitious project. The aim is to collect in an imperial way the sum total of what humans know and to catalogue it and to organise it. So parallel to Alexander trying to conquer the whole world, here we've got as well the intellectual equivalent of trying to conquer the whole world of knowledge. They also collected people. Mm. The people that revolved around the museum, the intellectuals, we could call them, but also the scientists, the doctors, the poets, the grammarians, were part of the collection, and they interacted with the collection. It was this kind of hybrid collection of texts and people that then interacted with each other. It was, it was fortunate, Matthew Nichols, was it, was it, or was it deliberate that they, the city was on a, a, a place that was near these marshy reed beds which gave the papyri and the papyri gave them something to write on? It's, it's certainly fortunate. Um, the kings, we're told, in another one of these attractive stories, um, used it to their advantage at one point by completely embargoing the export of papyrus. There are lots of stories about the desperate acquisitiveness of the Ptolemies in this project to acquire everything and, and to be a non pari library. So we're told they banned the export of papyrus um, to stop the Pergamene kings amassing their rival library. And further, these kings in Pergamon then invented parchment as a writing surface in order to uh, dodge around that ban. Now, I don't think that story is wholly true, but it, it does indicate the importance of the papyrus industry to the creation of books. Can we just develop the content a little more? Simon has very grandly said, like Alexander, having conquered the terrestrial world, and conquered the intellectual world, and there it is. But what can we go into it a little more, Seraphine? What Homer has been mentioned, but other other pe other writers. There's mathematicians, there's engineers. There's it, it's a place where technological uh, uh, um, ideas are advanced, and so on. Can we have a bit of detail? Yes, um, Homer is, I think, one of the most important and interesting cases there. Um, I could mention Euclid. Euclid, the writer of the Elements, which was the main textbook for uh, uh, geometry and also arithmetic, even in British schools until I was 50 years ago, um, wrote, Euclid wrote the Elements apparently within the cultural context of the, um, the Library of Alexandria. The Elements is a collection of previous mathematical knowledge. Euclid may have added something to it, but what he seems to have done is... Uh, um, looked at what was there and systematized it in a way that makes it very logically organized. So if he was working within the library, it makes sense to see him as going to the section of the library where the mathematics is, looking at it, and then putting it together in what becomes a canonical text. And again, we're talking about these people being drawn there because the Ptolemies were putting money into it. They would get the equivalent. They would be well, well enough paid, or we must assume, or they wouldn't have gone, would they? Uh, well enough looked after, given great opportunities. Can we develop that even more, Simon? So, well, we know it was a place for uh, research in science. We know about uh, anatomical research. But perhaps the most interesting one is, is what happens to poetry. 
in this period. That's, that's what I'm most interested in. Uh, and that's to say that when you start to write from within the library, you start to create this sort of elitist, privileged world of superior knowledge. And one of the ways that you show off your status is by knowing things that people don't know. And consequently, poetry becomes this very, very specialised, individual, competitive genre. We move away from the great why public literature. Why is it more literature. important as a matter of interest than mathematics? Just it's not more important. It's one of the ways in which well, you why see did they show off with poetry? I'm just fascinated. Mm. Why did they want to show off with poetry rather than with mathematics for, uh, and all the, or philosophy mm. or engineering, all the other things? Just why did they go for poetry? They showed off with all of those areas. Yeah. But the reason why we know poetry to be so important is because it gets picked up by so many people in later generations. Right. So the, the Latin poets picked it up in the same way. But it's undoubtedly the medical texts, as Serafina can talk, to, talk about, were you know, hugely influential in, 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 at the same time, as were the engineering ones as well. Matthew? The first four Ptolemies, at least, were all intellectual figures themselves. So these uh, poets, philosophers... In what sense? I mean, they, uh, did they write stuff, or did they back they were, stuff? Yeah, they were interested in branches of learning, like uh, the fourth Ptolemy was a playwright. Um, I think the second was interested in zoology. They were all of them keen to present themselves as intellectual figures and to collect scholars around them to display themselves as such and to interact with them. We know that mm. the Ptolemies, right down to the last one, Cleopatra, went and attended debates in the Museum. So it's an important part of royal self-presentation at this date. The man Callimachus of Cyrene, he produced uh, Alexandria, the, the library's first catalogue. Can you give us some notion of the impulse behind this yes. huge uh, feat? It's uh, a really significant moment in the history of scholarship because rather than just being a catalogue with shelf numbers on it, which it isn't quite, it's a vast bibliographical project whose aim is to categorise, list and make accessible and knowable the complete gamut of, of literature, as Simon was saying. So it's called the Pinnakes. It's in 120 books, um, five times the size of Homer's Iliad, for example. It's an enormous work. And it divides literature up um, by form and by genre. An interesting question about the interaction of those two. So it starts with a division between poetry and prose. Within poetry, there'll be epic, lyric, dramatic. Within dramatic, there'll be comic and tragic. Um, within each of those sub-sub-genres, there'll be a list of authors alphabetically. Each author will have um, a little biographical entry. Um, I have one here and could read it if you wanted. Um, for example, Eudoxus, whose father was Iskanes, from Cnidus, astronomer, geometer, physician, legislator. He studied geometry under Architas and medicine under Philistion of Sicily. So a little potted sketch. And then a list of that man's works um, alphabetically. So it immediately makes this vast mass of books, this 500,000 books, um, accessible and, and comprehensible. And also it establishes a canon, which is important. Simon, can we uh, uh, dig into the significance and importance of this great catalogue, this catalogue mm -hmm. at the time, but then since then, ever since then? Mm -hmm. Well, it organises knowledge in a way that it hadn't been organised before. It's a way it took the principles of Aristotle and applied them on a vast scale so that now literature falls into genres, we can put them in these areas, and we start to do scholarship on them. And what's so interesting about the catalogue is that it's actually, a, as it were, a meta-text. It's above the... It's not a piece of literature, it's commenting on literature. And this is the great period of grammatical commentary, of the beginnings of literary criticism, of... Uh, of, of commentary on all sorts of texts, on writing in the margins of all sorts of texts. So it's not just that you produce literature, but you actually have to produce things that you talk about literature. And so it's one of the great periods for the organisation of scholarship as we know it. So Homer becomes one of the founding texts, not because it's epic poetry and we read about it, but because we have to do commentary on it, we have to learn how to do literary criticism, and that's the basis of a scholarly education. Uh, sorry, can I ask... Sorry, you were saying? I was just going to add that, of course, it's a very rational process, um, that it's susceptible to human reason. That these are not sacred texts of which not one letter can be changed. They can be improved, edited, organised and categorised. Serafina, this is a place of active scholarship. You mentioned Euclid. Uh, we understand Archimedes went there too, and so did Galen. Can you... Uh, on his way back to Pope, nevertheless he went there. Can you give us some idea of what they might have... Give us the big, you've, you've talked about Euclid, but what Archimedes might have got from there and uh, what uh, uh, Galen might have got from there and other scholars, just what, the, what sort of work they could do because of this library. Um, Alexandria became a bit like Athens was in its golden age, so it started to attract 
intellectuals, scientists, doctors from all over the Greek world, even those who didn't deceive the patronage of the Ptolemies directly, even after the Ptolemies went, which is the case of Galen, the idea that Alexandria was the place to be if you wanted to learn and be at the cutting mm. edge of research remained. Mm. So uh, they went there because they had resources in the library. They went there because there were other people they could interact and discuss with. They went there because they could cross-pollinate with other people. So we find a lot of uh, um, research that borrows ideas from other fields of knowledge. We've heard a little bit, quite a bit about literature and so on, but the, the engineering and technological invention was supposed to be considered to be very important, as time went on, people said how important that had been to the development of engineering technology. Equally, Galen, uh, who lasted for 1,800 years with, it, with his anatomy and so on, he got something from that. Can you talk a little about that and, and give us a steer in those directions? To start from the engineering, one of the most direct references we have in the literature to the patronage of the Ptolemies is a passage in a treatise which is about building catapults, war engines. The author is called the File of Byzantium and he writes in the third, late 3rd century BC and he says explicitly that the engineers <laughs> in Alexandria made enormous leaps forward in the construction of uh, war machines because of the kings there who, he says, were ambitious and loved technology. So he makes a very direct correlation between putting money into research and research actually progressing. <laughs> And we know that Galen was Galen of Pergamum, and, and, and he went back to work with his gladiators, work with whom he could, <laughs> he could look at very closely for <laughs> what he needed to find. But what did he get out of Alexandria? What was there for him to come? What was there for him was, I think, the presence of a lot of other doctors with uh, very different ideas. So he found... Um, ideal ground for developing his ideas in competition with others, in opposition sometimes with others. What he found there was the accumulated knowledge of centuries, which was not just about anatomy and physiology, but also about the pharmacology, what kind of drugs you can use. There's another very nice passage in one of Galen's treatises where he talks about going down to the arbor the port of Alexandria to talk to the sailors and see what they've brought in and whether what they have can be used in uh, curing diseases or uh, putting together drugs that can be useful to heal sick people. Matthew Nichols. Galen, as well as being a doctor, is um, a man of letters. There's no distinction between the two at this date, of course. And he is almost obsessed with the quality of the text that he's reading because ancient texts are handwritten, they're susceptible to error and corruption. And Galen spends a lot of time talking about the authenticity and accuracy of his text. And what he really wants to get is uh, a manuscript copy, an, an old copy that hasn't had a chance to accumulate errors. So one of the things he finds at Alexandria, as he does in libraries elsewhere, like at Rome, are these authentic, premium, well-kept uh, copies of books. For example, in a pharmacological recipe, um, even a minute scribal error can be disastrous. If you uh, prescribe 10 grams of a, a drug rather than one gram, it can be uh, appalling. So Galen really has to get an accurate text. Simon, we, you, we, I think it was you who spoke earlier about the... Uh, it was. About the... No, it was, it was Serafina. No, about the different sorts of war, and one was the cultural wars, and the aqua there's something called the acquisition scandals. The Ptolemy was by hook and by crook, wasn't it? I will get your book. We want... Yes, absolutely. The, the, the desire to get everything and to get the best text is very important. And the most famous story is that in Athens there was an authorised text of the great tragedians. Aeschylus, Sophocles and Euripides and this was kept under lock and key in Athens and was the one text from which you could copy to make plays to, uh, to spread around the world Ptolemy was very keen to see this as he said, and Athens said, under no circumstances, we're not letting this book out of us. They said, well, we'll pay. He said, we'll pay a huge amount of money. I mean, talent upon talent of silver, I mean, really sort of millions, in order just to have a look at it, please. Could you just send it over so we can make a copy and we'll give you this deposit? And the Athenians thought, well, that's such a huge deposit, we'll, we'll risk it. And, of course, 
the book never came back, and they could never get it. And um, similar stories abound that he was they just did very... Send, they were kind enough to send a... a they, said, they, they sent back a copy, of a course. Copy, yeah. Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> uh, yes, um, and, uh, for example, the Ptolemies also confiscated books on ships passing through the harbour. So much so that uh, Galen again says that some books in the library were marked from the ships on their little tickets um, <laughs> because they'd been pinched from uh, passing merchantmen. I should never forget that the uh, imperial project of the library was very much an imperial project. <laughs> when we're talking about intensity, I mean, you're talking about getting the, the correct text. Um, can you give us an example of how intensely they did work at it? Let's take Homer. Everybody knows Homer. We've got the Iliad, the Odyssey, the key text, the great Greek key text. Now, We've, you've already mentioned that those were under lock and key in Athens, but how corrupted had they been? What did they do at Alexandria? What did they do about getting Homer, pushing it back to what they thought was its original pure form? Well, they spent absolute hours looking at the text. They would start to find, are there any anomalies? Does the story make perfect sense? Is there a little gap? And if there was a problem, they would excise the lines. They didn't throw anything away, but they would mark on the text that they thought this line was corrupt or obscure. Then there was the question of Homeric language that was already antique by the 5th century BCE, let alone the 3rd century. And so people couldn't quite understand it. So you had to do a lot of grammatical work to discuss, was this the right form? Could we change this word or not? And as soon as we start doing this work, we develop obsessiveness. We get these pictures of these obsessive academics working away, arguing with each other, and at the same time parody. There's a wonderful poem that talks about the academics of, of Alexandria as gonia bombukes, people who sit in the corner and mumble about whether the right word in Homer is min or nin. And this sort of parodying of the obsessive academic starts exactly the same time as the academic start. Seraphina, so, was there... Uh, uh, it's already been mentioned, because obviously there was, but how did the um, dominating imperialistic nature of Ptolemy's uh, cultural policy affect other cultures? I mean, were they sort of putting down the Egyptian, take the one that's nearest, the one on whose soil they sit? Can you tell us about that? I think that's a, real, a really controversial point. Um, I think for many years scholarship has focused on the opposition between the Greek Ptolemies and the rest of the population. But I would say in the last 15 years or so, we're looking more and more at the ways in which the two cultures were meshing with each other. Um, so I've mentioned the translations from Egyptian into Greek. Um, recent work has been done on the way um, in poetry, in Greek poetry, images taken from Egyptian culture, typically Egyptian themes are used, as if there really was an effort at some point to put the two together rather than just oppose them. One of the easiest ways to think about that is that the Ptolemies, as rulers, started to marry their sisters. Now, that was not normal in Greece, to have brother-sister marriage, but it was normal amongst the Egyptians. And the fact that the ruling elite could pick up that cultural model shows how deeply they did, at some level, absorb Egyptian culture. And to talk about another neighbouring culture, um, there's a, a text called the Latter Letter of Aristeus that implies, it states, that the Ptolemies were responsible for commissioning the first Greek translation of the uh, Hebrew Pentateuch, the, the translation that came to be known as the Septuagint, we're told was commissioned and translated in the Museum at Alexandria. Can we turn to the demise of the library? It, it seems to have taken a long time and, and, and many uh, false reports. We've talked about the Ptolemies going right through to Cleopatra. Everybody will know about Cleopatra and Mark Antony and Julius Caesar, so they go on for about three centuries there. But, uh, and there's a feeling that the library sort of comes to an end there, but it, go it goes on for many more centuries afterwards. Just can we explore that and the reasons for its tenacity and the influence it continued to have or did not continue to have? Starting with you, uh, Matthew Nichols. There, there were reports that Julius Caesar went to Alexandria, burnt it down, burnt the library down yes. as well. That's wrong. Uh, yes, it is. Um, it's a short answer. Um, I think it tells us something about the um, nature of stories circulating around the library and around Julius Caesar, um, that the library is big enough that its destruction becomes a seismic event. Uh, Julius Caesar is the sort of figure that these stories get imputed to. The, the story is that he um, traced uh, his enemy Pompey um, to Alexandria, found that he was already dead, 
got involved in a local succession dispute between the last uh, straggling lines of the Ptolemaic dynasty, was holed up in the harbour and decided to fire the harbour and the fleet to, to fight his way out. And in that fire, uh, the flames spread to some books which were destroyed. And that story, uh, over time, becomes the story that Julius Caesar burned down the entire library. So the figure of books destroyed escalates from uh, 40,000 in the first century AD up to 500,000 a few centuries later. The story keeps getting amplified. So Caesar didn't do it, Serafina Cuomo. Uh, what's the next... Uh, uh, who's the next supposed culprit? Sorry to use this colloquial term, but... Mm -hmm. well, the Christians are supposed to have burnt libraries in Alexandria, but... When what the date are we talking about there? About the 3rd century AD, that sort of thing? I would say 4th four, to 5th <laughs> century AD. We know that once Christianity becomes definitely the dominant religion in Egypt, um, riots break out in Alexandria at various points, led by bishops and involving monks. It's all a bit murky because the literature about Christianity is always biased one way or the other. But Christians are involved in killing one of the most uh, uh, prominent Alexandrian intellectuals in late antiquity. The famous Hypatia of Alexandria is lynched by a Christian mob. There are reports that they burnt a library which was... <coughs> more likely to be not the big library of Alexandria, but a smaller library around the temple of Serapis. And <coughs> Sorry. Um, with Christianity taking over, um, it could be argued that the predominantly um, non-Christian contents of what may have been in the library at this stage were not as valued as they used to be. Can we develop that? Because this is another theme that the Christians, after Constantine, become the, the, the it, that becomes the, the imperial religion, and uh, there is a pagan library there, um, gods that the Christians have rejected. They want their one god, and that it gives them a focus uh, for unity on their own side and for attack on the other. Is, mm -hmm. And one, the library becomes a, an object of attack. Is there truth in that? Well, what there is a truth of is that in Egypt was particularly well known for its absolute violent riots and its violent fundamentalism in early Christianity in these centuries. Uh, there were uh, the monks of the desert who came in who were not particularly well educated but were extremely uh, unpleasant, according to a lot of the local <laughs> sources, and uh, Hypatia these wasn't. The, these yeah, are the Antonine monks and yeah, the yeah, yeah, Semitic monks of the desert. Yeah, they were, they were celibate. They were aggressively anti-woman. They were aggressively anti-intellectual in certain ways, and they didn't just lynch Hypatia. They ripped off her flesh with oyster shells, and the flesh still quivering was thrown into the crowd, according to the, the contemporary I sources. Don't know if we needed to know that. Oh, I don't know if we needed to know that, but it gives a sense of the. And so they destroyed Greek temples. The Serapeum was destroyed. They destroyed all sorts of artifacts. They really wanted to get rid of the signs of paganism, and. In that context, it's quite likely that there would have been destructiveness of the library, but we still hear stories of the library after this, so it is unlikely that the library itself was destroyed. Yes. There's also <laughs> just a little footnote before you pile into this, uh, mm -hmm. Matthew a footnote that the, the Christian's way of presenting knowledge was different in its form, in its yes, physical form, from the papyri. Can you just bring that to bear? Certainly. Um, it's less picturesque than the oyster shells, but um, the, the technology of the book changes. Um, the pagan authors write, broadly speaking, on papyrus um, scrolls. Christian authors, broadly speaking, use parchment codices, a sonely folding book, similar to our own modern book. Um, because all books have a shelf life, and literally, and papyrus is brittle, um, and the ink fades and worms eat it, what the Christian authors are interested in copying uh, changes, and so as the papyrus scrolls of the library come to the end of their natural lives, they're not recopied. So it needn't be a single conflagration destruction event. It's also a shift in book technology and a shift in taste that accounts for the loss of much of this stuff. So what's your thought? But the libraries go, we're in about the 4th and 5th mm -hmm. century AD, and we still have a very big library there, as I understand it. There's a reasonable consensus around the table. <laughs> so so when, what significance? Is it, it obviously losing its significance because of Christianity and the Empire, but it's still an enormously powerful library. Mm -hmm. Yet there's still this idea that it came to an end, it was destroyed. So can we ferret away about that a bit more? Well, the last story that we have is the Muslim story which is probably also untrue. But the story is that the Pasha who turned up said either the works there are the Quran, 
or they're not in the Quran. If it's not in the Quran, they're of no use to us. If it's the Quran, we already have it, so let's burn this lot. Now, that is again one of those stories that gets associated with uh, a powerful ruler turning up, just like the Caesar story, and there's no reason to assume that that is actually true. But at some point or another, in, that li in those centuries, it's quite likely that the library fell into such disuse that it, it just sort of faded away rather than was destroyed in some cataclysmic event. Now, that's not historically so exciting. People always want uh, the foundation of the library was a genuine. I think most massive people don't want it. Actually, frankly, most people don't want it to be destroyed at all. No, that's also <laughs> true. But if it's going to be destroyed, since it was, its foundation was so exciting and such a world-changing event, people would like its destruction to have been a world-changing event. And I'm afraid, I suppose, to swear to you, just not using it is a, a sadder, quieter way of it ending. Not with a bang, with a whimper. That yeah, thing, and Matthew, Matthew. I think that's true. And long before that, uh, the, the last reported destruction event is AD 642 when the Arabs take uh, Alexandria. Uh, long before that, the centre of gravity in the, the classical intellectual world had shifted off to Pergamum, to Rome, to Byzantium, to Milan. And the library, I'm afraid, probably just faded away into the sand or the sea. A moment silence, I think, should be observed here. Uh, <laughs> so give us the legacy of that. Did it have an immediate legacy, or are we, are we amplifying the legacy from our own perspective now? Serafina? I think it did have an immediate legacy. Um, I think late antiquity was a much more lively period than we usually read. So to the extent to which a lot of cultural life was going on in the 4th, the 5th, the 6th century B AD and beyond... Um, the legacy of the Library of Alexandria hasn't stopped because one way or the other a lot of the texts have come down to us a lot of the literature was produced in late antiquity during a period of supposed decline and a lot of this literature consisted in the commentating, annotating discussing meta-texts that Simon was describing so the meta-text practice continues Finally, Simon, what do you think? The influence ripples through at the time and still goes through. First of all, without the survival of those texts, thanks to Alexandria, we don't get the Renaissance. So we don't get modern Western culture as we know it. And more specifically, without the practices of the library, we wouldn't have the university in the form we have it today, we wouldn't have the organisation of knowledge we have today, we wouldn't have the whole institutions of scholarship that we recognise. And that seems to me to be the sort of legacy uh, that is really profound. Well, thank you very much, Simon Goldhill, Sarafina Quova, Matthew Nichols. Uh, next week we'll be talking the about the Boxer Rebellion in China around 1900. Thank you very much for listening. We hope you've enjoyed this Radio 4 podcast. You can find hundreds of other programmes about history, science and philosophy at bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4.